ever stare at yourself as an image that large. Good afternoon, and uh, thanks for uh, being here this afternoon. I'm Simon Nicholson. I'm actually from the IoT development group at Oracle. What I'd like to talk about is how we're applying IoT in the context of the enterprise and specifically around supply chain. Now, we've been working around IoT, or previously M2M, probably going back a decade, 10 years now. Many customers buying our Oracle technology to build out their own M2M silos, um, actually you know, instrumenting devices and providing dashboards or providing some level of service and running that on-premise. And what became very apparent from that around four years ago was that actually IoT and cloud, as you've heard from many others this afternoon or this today, is actually that they're very natural uh, they have a very natural relationship, partly because of the sizes involved, number of devices, uh, num the amount of data. But the challenge here is, despite all the hype around IoT, many projects are failing to deliver the value. And in part, because it's not about the volume of data, it's about the velocity of data. There's one project that we're working with in Europe at the moment where it's a relatively modest number of devices, a few thousand. But they're sampling at 10 times a minute. 10 times a second, I'm sorry. So actually, that one company is going to generate more data in a day than Twitter. And their data center is certainly not equipped to handle that volume of data. The second consideration is actually it's not about just instrumenting a device and delivering a dashboard. A dashboard will tell you what happened, what went wrong. But really, how do you complete that last stage of the journey and get that data along with all the other enterprise data in the enterprise systems and processes that you're already running? So in terms of our strategy, it's very, very simple. Try to make it easy. But really focusing less on what devices you're connecting and what you're gathering from them, but actually what outcomes are you trying to drive? Is it operational improvement? Is it enablement of a new service? Is it reduction in warranty costs? Is it actually having better response times to your customers every time something fails? And really starting with that outcome and then working backwards and saying, OK, what analytics do we need to perform here? And obviously, having spent 40 years as a company gathering data, storing data, and then deriving value out of data, it's an area that we've got a reasonable amount of expertise in. And then finally, how do we actually then bring the data in from the devices? Now, most deployments follow this path. And I'll just build it out. We start with the devices, and we connect those assets, and we gather data from them. And it's amazing how many companies want to get to the second phase. We want to do predictive maintenance. We want to do predictive analytics but for no other reason other than they have the, wow, I didn't know people were doing that with it. Six months later, they're still gathering data and deriving real business value just from connecting the assets and studying what they're actually learning from that. Over time, they obviously start to run predictives, and then you know, that's providing them with new levels of insight and actually helps them regenerate or change the way their enterprise is working. But key to this, utterly key to this, is what we see on the on my left, your right, is that until that data arrives in the data center, arrives in your existing applications and processes, you haven't really fully utilized its value, or indeed, in many cases, exposed its value. Now, there's another shift happening in, in the market right now, which is as we start with the consumption model, I buy something, I own it, I spend capex on it. It then goes wrong. It's OK, someone comes out to fix it but it's not working, I'm not getting any value from it. I then look at what did we learn over the last, mu the last week, the last month, the last year? What have I learned? I've learned that you know, we had a failure here, we're doing well there. And then finally, how do we respond to those outages? Typically through some form of central service organization, we take the call, we schedule someone to go out on site. But it's changing. Customers are now saying, I don't want to own it, I want to pay for it as I use it aircraft engines, Hitachi Rail in the UK, a whole new fleet of trains to go live on one of the operators next year, where the operator's paying for the train based on usage. That changes the model, because if the train's out or is in maintenance for too long, not only do Hitachi not get paid for it, they might actually have to then suffer some form of breach of SLA penalty. So actually understanding when failure is going to occur is critical. Now, furthermore, I talked about static analytics, learning what has happened. But what's the point of learning something if you can't apply it against how you move forwards? So it's not just about static analytics and dashboards. 
It's the ability to take those learnings and apply them against the data in real time as it's coming through. Remember my example of my customer in, elsewhere in Europe who's generating gigabytes of data that they can't push into their data center, the pipe's not big enough. How do they trim that down and generate megabytes per day of actionable outcomes? And that's where the real-time analytics plays a role. And then finally, in terms of how we service the customer, we're working with Berkshire Hathaway Automotive in the United States. They touch the second biggest dealer network. They touch 20,000 vehicles a day. What they're finding is that 40% of their maintenance activity is now software related. So they no longer need to bring a car, get the customer to drive the car to the, you know, to the maintenance facility, oil, hydraulic lifts, etc. They could actually do the update over the air whilst the car's parked outside the customer ha customer's home. That actually has a major impact downstream in their customer service operation that we'll touch on again shortly. A couple of other examples. SoftBank, large operator telco in, in Japan, they're actually running a service which is electronic scooter rental business on one of the islands in Japan. Now, I'm not, time doesn't permit me to go into full details about this today. One of the key things about this, though, one of the key takeaways is the number of weeks it took them to put this system live, two weeks. So they managed to stage it, use various cloud elements, and get a live working implementation inside two weeks. And now, if you go to the island, I forget, forget the name, you can actually rent an electronic scooter, ride it around. It'll tell you the charging levels. It will take your payment details. It will tell you if you breach a geofence. It will even tell you if you're in danger of missing the last ferry off the island. Nice example, new service. Vancy facilities in France are actually running commercial premises. And what they're doing is, instead of someone sitting in a meeting room and thinking, it's getting a bit hot in here, shall we call someone and get them to come and have a look, which interrupts the flow, they're instrumenting the rooms. They're instrumenting the facility. Therefore, the, the facility then starts to automatically generate service requests. So mid-meeting, we're sitting there, and then suddenly someone opens the door, comes in, changes something in the settings, goes away again. Uninterrupted service, high level of service to their customers. Also, if a meeting room hasn't been used during the day, why clean it? You're going to pay for it, so why clean it? And further, they're actually, with all this data, they're generating new insights for their customers. For example, did you know why no one's using the open plan space that you've just renovated? It might be because there's a team of people sitting in the far corner every Monday morning, sit there and just talk about nothing else about what they've done over the weekend, basically making the, the whole space unusable for anybody else wanting to get on a conference call or deliver a webcast. Now, what we're seeing with these examples and more is that it's not just about, as we do this transition, it's not just about the devices and the sensors, and it's not about the platform. It's actually about how we realize the application. There's enormous amounts of energy going into how we actually build the devices and the platform. But really, if you go to your CXO or you go to the line of business user, what they want to see is something materialize in front of them. So that's one need. How do I expose the application? The second need is how do I shift from knowing when something has failed to knowing when it's about to fail and what probability of failure actually exists and doing this in ways that are humanly understandable. Therefore, can I buy more time? I might not be able to get an engineer out in time. I might fail my SLA. OK, how do I buy myself more time? Can I do an over-the-air update? Can I change its behavior to buy myself an extra hour, an extra two hours? Finally, and this is a bit of a busy slide, I apologize, but this is where a lot of companies are now putting a lot increasing amounts of investment and where certainly we're focusing, is how do I enable that digital thread? This isn't an IoT discussion. This is a discussion about how we use IoT data with a lot of other forms of data that we're gathering and bring it together and blend it across the entirety of the supply chain. Now, talking about the supply chain, here's a model of the supply chain. From top left on your side, product lifecycle management, where we have the ideas, we define the bomb, we define what we're going to build or what we're going to update, and then how we take it into market through order processing, through, through inventory, through manufacturing, through transportation and logistics, and then finally out, excuse me, out to customer service. How do we actually apply IoT to that model? Well, initially for us, we see three immediate opportunities. And I can't imagine there are many people in this room who aren't already looking at or aware of Industry 4.0 or whatever it happens to be called in your country as a, as a focus of momentum. But certainly, many of the customers we're working at is, how do I get better 
understanding of what's going on in my production facility and break out of the operational world, which is currently its preserve, and actually take that data and apply it into my, my actual IT-based uh, supply chain management systems. Secondly, how do I get a better understanding of what's happening with my goods as they move from my factory gate up to my warehouse or indeed up to the point of delivery? And again, not just building this as a fleet management silo, but actually looking at this and taking this fleet data and applying it into all facets of my supply chain management. And finally, I talked about this already, but how do I actually also take that same set of data, that information, and apply it within my service operation? Two other factors at play here. First of all, there aren't enough engineers on the planet being trained to go out and service all these connected devices. So we've got to get smarter about the way we address them. Secondly, the average age of the engineer, certainly in the UK, is dropping. The service engineer age is dropping from over 40 to now under 30. So we don't have the same benefit of all that experience that's been gathered over years of working with this model or that model. So how do we help them actually provide them? And we talked about augmented reality earlier. How do we use tools and technologies such as augmented reality combined with our back-end processes and the IoT data coming off the device that we're fixing to actually enable first-time fix? I mean, realistically, especially if you're on a service-based model, you need to be looking at first-time fix at 95, 90 to 95% first time. Otherwise, you know, second time out is going to cost the business money. Now, again, a slightly busy slide, but I want to impress upon that it's not just about the IoT data. You'll see there with asset visibility on the fourth row down. But we're also looking to take that data and combine it with what's going on in the market. You know, what are we hearing about what's happening in the broader market? What's the price of a, a particular asset, a particular commodity? We're also looking to see what's happening upstream and downstream of us in the supply chain. Also, what's going on? What information do we have that we've gathered through historical relationship with that customer or other processes? And then finally, what's the customer saying about us? What have they said to our customer service organization? What are they saying publicly? And how do we bring that together and bring all that information to bear, apply it within our back-end processes? And this has led us to actually enhance the Oracle IoT, if it would permit me to talk about our offering for a second. We introduced the Oracle IoT Cloud Service two years ago as a platform, as a service offering. And over those two years, we've gained a lot of customers and gained a lot of experience around the world. As I mentioned earlier, one of the things we learned is that many customers actually want some form of web-based or mobile device-based application that shows them the true value of the information that's flowing through the pipe as it's flowing. So it can actually help them understand where they have risk, where they have exposure, where they need to act and combining that with the close couple integration into the back-end systems, whether it be your supply chain system, your ERP, your customer service, your fleet service management, whichever component or components, because there could be multiple, needs to receive that data in order to drive a business action. And there are three of the, these applications initially. One for monitoring assets, as might exist in a building such as this, or vending machines or equipment in a hospital. American Medical Association recently reported the average nurse, on average, spends an hour a day looking for stuff, looking for equipment that works. How do we actually reduce that hour a day? How do we, you know, in, ideally remove it? Production monitoring. Not just what's going on with a specific machine or a specific line, but what's going on in a factory? What's going across all my factories? How's one factory performing against another factory? and starting to, as a, certainly as a CXO level, to try to get a better picture of what risks I'm facing in my production, my production lines. And then finally, talked about the movement of goods from dock to dock. It's one thing to schedule the, the transit of goods and services, but what's the driver doing? What's the vehicle doing? And what's the state of the goods in the back? Now, in closing, just a few screens to show you. I said at the start, our focus is on making this easy. These are some of the screens, and happy to show you a, a longer demo, if time permits, um, over at our booth. These are some of the screens from our production monitoring application. And all the applications start in the same way. You start with a map, and it shows you where things of interest are. These are factories. And at the bottom there, I've got a ribbon with certain KPIs that tell me about factory performance, how many products I've produced, how many machines are currently operating, and where potentially I have machines that are down. 
I can then drill in to a specific factory, either through search or just by click, 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 navigating down, and actually look at the process map for a specific product in a specific factory. If I'm memory serves, yeah, this is Berlin. This is an extruder head pr process in Berlin. But I can now see which machines are involved in the production of that product in that location. And I can even do comparatives. So I can start to say, well, how's this, this plant? And now I can switch to a floor plan view. How's this facility actually performing in comparison with the other facilities across my organization, or indeed across my supply chain, depending on the relationship I have upstream, downstream? So my goal today was to make this a very, very brief overview in terms of how we're now saying it's not necessarily just about IoT, but it's how we drive a business outcome within the supply chain, within your business processes and within your business applications, customer service, HR, and more, and use the IoT data as it's moving from the sources into the enterprise systems and actually use the, the, that capability to show the value drive the predictive analytics, and actually ensure the right business outcome is landing within the, the right element of your enterprise back end. And I think with that, I'd like to say kitos. I believe that's appropriate. And thank you very much for your attention.